and in your life. We are going to continue a series this morning called Parables and Perspectives. The series is going to take us right up to the Easter season. Uh, it's Parables and Perspectives. So we're going to live today in Luke chapter 15. We were there last week, and we will still be there next week, and then we're going to transition on. And so last week, we talked about how parables, everyone say parables. Parables are stories. Jesus was a master storyteller, and he, invited, he invites you and I into this space when he would tell stories, to root ourselves in the story, to see others and their perspectives, but most importantly, to see God from his perspective. So the only thing we ask as we go through these parables together is, number one, any, in and every parable, let's let Jesus be Jesus. Sometimes we can insert ourselves as Savior. We can see our church, and then there's that lost, bad, broken world. Sometimes Jesus is talking to all of us together. So let's let Jesus be Jesus. The rest of us are somebody else in the parable, but let's put ourselves in other people's shoes that see life from a different perspective. Let's do that. And so last week we talked about the lost sheep. That's the story we talked about, that a, that a shepherd had a hundred sheep and one of them wandered away and it was lost. The sheep was lost. I want to remind you that Jesus told these three stories of a lost sheep, a lost coin, which is today, and then a lost son or lost sons, actually. He told these three stories because the Pharisees of the day were asking him, why are you hanging around with tax collectors and sinners? Why are you doing that? So th this is the question. Jesus is answering that question with these three stories. And it's an important thing. So there are three perspectives that we're going to look at today. We are going to look at the perspective of a lost coin and we're going to root ourselves in that part of the parable for a minute. We're also going to talk about over here, friends and neighbors, how we respond to lostness as followers of Jesus. And lastly, we're going to step over here and we're going to look at the heart of the woman and what it represents. So remember if I said last week that the Pharisees asked Jesus, you know, why are you hanging around with tax collectors and sinners? I know I just said it a minute ago. I'm just reminding you. And so he launches into a story about shepherds that would have immediately offended them because they saw themselves as better than shepherds. This was an incredible patriarchal time. Women had complete different values. It wasn't like our time today, although we still have a long way to go as a culture for equality. So there was a completely different set of values. And so if, G if they were offended at Jesus saying, imagine you were a shepherd, in today's story, you can imagine their hearts when he said, so imagine now that you're a woman. How do you know that Jesus has a way of offending our hearts to reveal something? That he does that sometimes in an intentional way. And so this morning, let's turn to Luke chapter 15. You can turn or you can tap in your Bible to Luke chapter 15, verses 8 to 10. Right. So let's read together. Here's the story. Now again, so last week, I'm going to do a quick recap again. Last week, there was a sheep that wandered away from the shepherd, and it was in a vulnerable place because it was lost outside the house or outside the pen. Uh, this week, Jesus tells a story about a coin being lost inside the house. Everyone say, inside the house. Anyone here ever lose their keys inside the house? Oh, how frustrating is that? Because you know sort of where they are. You know they're in the house, but you still can't find them. All right? We probably, there's, there's lots of things you may have lost inside your own house. That's your own fun story. All right? Anyone here ever years later been looking for something, you can't find it, you go out and buy it and replace it, and as soon as you go and buy it and replace it, you spring clean, you go, there it is. So it's lost inside the house. So here's what the scripture says. Here's the parable. What woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? Everyone say, until she finds it. So there's a passion to the pursuit here, okay? There's a passion to her pursuit. And when she has found it, this shows you the value of this coin, okay? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. So there's some great value to what she has found. If you, if you lose your keys and you find your keys, normally you don't call your neighbors and say, come on over for a party, I found my keys. Unless you're just a party person, then you do, hey, it's an excuse for a party. Come on over, I found my keys, right? But that would be weird. Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. How many of you know that every single day, somewhere on the planet, someone is giving their life to Jesus? So heaven is a consistent party. Heaven is a consistent place of joy 
where people are coming to know Jesus, where they're lost or being found, not, only, not just the right or the wrong or being corrected is right, it's where lost or being found. So again, three perspectives, one lost coin, friends and neighbors, and a woman. As we shared a moment ago, a single coin in these days was called a drachma, and it represented about a full day's wage. For those of you who work for the government and our Phoenix pay problem system, uh, we're not going to talk about that today, but you know that there can be issues, okay? When you're pinching pennies, every penny counts. And so for this woman, you can see it's a space, so she's lost about a full day's wages, and she's counting on those things, but she's lost it in the house. Now, her house doesn't have hardwood floors, so get that out of your mind. Think about stones that are put together that she begins to sweep. Think about a little coin that falls in between some stones that can get lodged there, why she's lighting a lamp and why she's sweeping it, which we're going to get to in just a moment. But losing a sheep from a shepherd's perspective is losing a living thing. That living thing is in a, an incredible place of vulnerability due to wolves and prey that want to devour it. However, losing a coin is still loss, but it's different than losing a sheep. Yes, the sheep had value, but it's different. Losing a coin is it's you lose the ability to use that coin, but the coin's value isn't lost. Put it in our terms. If you lose 50, a $50 bill at your house, it's lost. You may have had plans for that $50. It's lost. But how many of you know the value of that $50 hasn't been lost even though it's lost? So if you invited someone else to your house and they happened to stumble upon, I can't believe it. I found $50. The first thing you would say is, that's mine. Right? Why would you say, that's mine? That's not yours. I lost that. That's mine. Why? Because it still has its, its value. Even though it's lost, it still retains its value. It's still valuable even though it's lost. It still retains its value because it's lost inside the house. Because it has an image that is backed by something that is significant. Now, we all have color printers and color photocopiers. If someone was to take a $50 bill and go to the photocopier in the front and begin to photocopy it, how many know that's not just a problem, that's a crime waiting to happen? So it's not just the appearance of that has value, it's the actual note itself that contains value, that has inherent value. And so again, Jesus cares about the things in your house that are lost, like lost dreams and lost desires, disappointments. He cares about these things. He cares about the loss of hope. We sang a song a moment ago, walking around these walls, and I thought by now they'd fall but they haven't. And so there's a sense of disappointment in the song. The next lyric is, but God, you haven't failed me yet. There's this sense of hope, but there's also this sense of loss in this space of, I thought that this was in my life and it, I, I had it and now it seems that I've lost it. I had this relationship and now I've seen that I've lost it and because I lost that relationship, now I don't know who I am. I feel like I've lost myself or lost my value. I had my health and now I've lost it and it feels as though I'm less valuable. I had this in my life. I, I used to have this much money and now I have this much money and people, because I had this much money and he saw me this way and now that I have this, I feel like something's lost. I feel like my value was tied to things. I used to have this title and it's lost and now I feel lost. And it's not lost out there. It's lost inside the house. But it's still lost. It's still lost. In another instance, 
Jesus was talking to somebody about taxes, turn to the person beside you and say, I love those. <laughs> Especially when they go up. I love those. Jesus was talking about taxes. And he asks for a coin. It's in Matthew 22, verses 19 to 21, and it reads this way. Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? In other words, who's on the coin? He's trying to verify, is this counterfeit or is it real? Is it photocopied or is this legit? Is this the real deal? Whose likeness on it? And then they said, Caesar's. And then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Like lost coins, Genesis says that every single one of us, every human being breathing air, past, present, and future, every single one of us is created in the image and the likeness of God which is called the Imago Dei, that your life is stamped with inherent worth and value and dignity. See, what was the central question that the Pharisees were asking Jesus? They were asking Jesus a value-based question. Why are you hanging around with tax collectors and sinners? What they were really asking is, why are you not hanging around with us? Because we are better than them. That's what they were asking. If you were really the Messiah, if you were really holy, then you'd be hanging out with us righteous people over here. You wouldn't be hanging around with them. Wherever there is a those in culture, there's always a them in culture. And it's always a value-based discrepancy. How many of that culture isn't fair? We divide by race, we divide by economics, we divide by intellect, we divide almost every way, shape, and form, but God is a God of unity. He is a God who pulls things together, and He is a God who is saying in this moment, in the person of His Son, in the person of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, He is saying to not only sinners and tax collectors, He is also speaking to something systemic in His culture about value-based conversations and value-based living and dividing and stepping on other people to elevate yourself. And He is engaging this moment, reminding them of the Genesis account that we, each and every one of us are marked with the image and likeness of God, that we bear the likeness of our Creator because we're humans, which gives our life inherent worth and dignity and value from womb to tomb and everything and everyone in between. Gives our lives inherent worth and value. And so from the perspective of the lost coin, I'm here to tell you today that no matter what you've gone through in a season of loss, no matter what has happened in life or in the world in which we live, your value has not been lost to your heavenly Father. That even if you're here today and you think or you feel absolutely lost, I want you to know not only does all heaven throw a party every single day, but there is a search party going on for your soul every single day. Why? Because God does not define you the way culture defines you. Now make no mistake about it, what Jesus said to the question of you're hanging around with tax collectors and sinners, make no mistake about it, love and the searching of God, love, love is not soft. He still says in all three instances they're lost. So there is a greater danger than earthly loss and it's called eternal loss. There is something that's greater than just having something lost on an earthly sense. You lose your keys, maybe you can get some new keys. You lose $50, you can earn $50. Uh, you lose your phone, you, you, you can't buy another one because you've got to take a mortgage out to get a phone these days. But, I mean, you can, but it's going to cost you like, you know, you can get to take a second mortgage out on the house to get another phone, but you can do it. And you can have that phone replaced. But Jesus is saying is that your life is irreplaceable. The value and dignity and worth that Jesus puts on the least of these has greater value than oftentimes that culture does. I'm not really sitting in these stools today like I'm supposed to anchor into it. I keep walking around. Turn the person beside you. It's okay. We love them anyways. <laughs> so let's just sit in this for a moment. 
has anything been lost? Is there anything that God wants to restore? Dreaming about God, would you restore this to my life? So let's move over here to the friends and the neighbors. Just like last week, there is an expectation in the heart of the Father that when lost people become found people, that we as found people celebrate that. That we throw parties. That we understand that the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Again, in the same story that Jesus told this week about the lost coin, which is lost, but its value isn't lost. It says again that that woman rejoices and calls her friends and her neighbors. And you can put yourself in her shoes for a moment. Why is she, why is she in this space where her heart is rejoicing so much? Because the thing about a coin is it's value neutral. The same coin, the same coin can be used to feed a family. It's the same coin that can be used to destroy a family. The same coin that can be used for blessing is the same coin, the same value that can be used for curse. The same coin that can, you can use to build up is the same coin. So the coin has inherent value, but the coin becomes invaluable in our hands. And this woman, you can just imagine yourself in her shoes that maybe she's got mouths to feed and she doesn't know how to make ends meet. Maybe she's got a, a mortgage to pay. Maybe she's got whatever it is. And this one lost coin, yes, she has nine coins still. But without this one coin, I can't do everything that I need to do. And I'm not sure if you've ever gone through a season in life of loss where it feels like you've lost something. I used to be able to minister this way, but because what was lost, now I'm disqualified and I, and I can't minister in that way. I used to be able to do this and I went through a season and I lost that and, and now it feels as though I can't do that. So is it any wonder why when she finds this coin that was lost and it's back home, she rejoices because it releases the fullness of her purpose of everything that I can do with what God has put into my hands, now I can do it. He has been restored to my life. It's been redeemed to my life. That which is lost has been found and it's reason to celebrate. One time somebody said to me when reading through these parables of the lost sheep, so there's 99 found sheep, one lost sheep, and all of heaven rejoices over the one lost sheep, and then you've got 99 found sheep. In this, you've got nine coins that are found coins and one lost coin, and all of heaven rejoices over the one lost coin coming a found coin, and the next week is about the sons. And da, 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 da. So just, somebody said to me, does God not care about the found things? Is it always just about the lost things? To which I wanted to say to them, oh, oh, finite, finite, finite human being, as though God can't do two things at the same time. What is God's heart that not one would perish? What is he articulating in the parable? Is he just like culture, putting a divide between lost and found things? No, he is articulating there's a difference between lost and found things. But God's heart celebrates not at lost over the expense of the found. No, 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 a thousand times no. God's heart celebrates in wholeness when that which is broken is restored, that which is lost has been restored and found. It's not just one over the other. God can do what God alone. He is the God of unity. He is the God of bringing things together. He is a God who can restore and redeem. Has anybody here in your life ever been a child? Can I see your hands, please? Okay, some of you are confused by that question. Anybody here uh, ever been a parent of at least uh, one or two kids? You've run into this as a parent, or maybe you did this when you were a child. Mom or dad, you love so-and-so more than you do me. You bought them a bike, and I got a hand-me-down. 
Oh, I'm, I'm actually celebrating. The older I get, did you know it reverses? No, no, I'm serious. I'm 44 years old. Did I tell the story last week of the, when the girl said, throw me the shoes? Oh, okay, I know I'm getting old. Uh, I'm going to take a slide, then I'm going to come back. I know I'm getting, I know I'm old because I was in a store. I, mean, I told you last week. I'm getting old because I can't remember if I told you last week. <laughs> but I was in a store called Vans at the Bayshore Mall. I was in a Vans store, not for myself because I don't belong there. I was buying shoes for my daughter's birthday and somehow ended up buying uh, both my daughter's shoes. I don't know how it worked, it just worked that way. <laughs> and so, the, the young lady working in the van store, I picked up the shoes, um, and if you're like me, I have the kids take me, text me pictures of what they, they're looking for, and I match the picture. Um, and so I said to the, I need the, these shoes in these sizes. And the girl said to me, well then just sauce me the shoe. And, and like, a, like, like a dog, I went, <laughs> like, I know you just spoke English. <laughs> so she just said, just sauce me the shoe. And I, I thought to myself, it, it's not helpful if you keep saying it over and over again. Like that's, <laughs> we are having a failure to communicate. <laughs> Found and I'm lost. <laughs> so I just walked over with the shoe like, and she said, I, I, I just meant like, toss it to me. Like, sauce me the shoe. And I went, oh, I'm 44. <laughs> and we had a moment, and then she looked at me like. <laughs> and it just ended with, can I please just buy those shoes? <laughs> and, and we did. I have no idea why I was telling that story at all. None whatsoever. No, no clue. Getting old, Lore. Let's go over here. That was just a pretty meadow story. Let he who has ears to hear. Let him hear that there was no point to that story. Oh, it's just. When a lost. When a sheep becomes lost, the shepherd never gives up ownership of his sheep. When the coin is lost, the woman never gives up ownership of her coin. And here's what it says. It says that she is the one who seeks diligently until she can find it. And then it says she is the one who lights a lamp, moves heaven and earth in her home until she finds it. There is no amount of darkness that, it can, that can extinguish the smallest of light. When I was a child, I had a deep, 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 deep fear of the dark. So what did my parents do? They did something perhaps yours may have. They bought me a little night light with like a three watt bulb you plug it into the wall and and my night light had like a shield in front of it like a superhero shield you'd look over there mine was spider-man because i'm just that cool and you it'd be dark and you turn your nail night light on, you know what your night light would light up? Like this much of the wall. <laughs> but it didn't matter. Because you can go into the darkest of night where you can't see your own hand in front of your face and you can take a single match and you can light it. And the darkness is no match for the smallest of light. And so Jesus says in this parable that this woman lights a lamp. That in order for things that are lost 
things to become found things. Light needs to enter that space. What did Jesus say? I am the light of the world. Light has come. And the darkness can never extinguish it. Jesus in this moment is saying with a heart of love to lost Pharisees who are inside the house. This is a Jewish man speaking to Jewish individuals who are in the house. Jesus is saying to them, you're in the house, but you're lost. In order for you to know that you're lost and get that, I got to turn on a little bit of light. Jesus is turning to tax collectors and sinners and saying, though you may be being devalued, you've never lost one ounce of your value to me. That I'm here to seek and save that which is lost. Now again, love is spectacularly beautiful, but it's not soft. As I said a moment ago, Jesus is still saying to every single one of them, you're lost. It's not mushy and fuzzy and he wasn't unclear in this moment. He wasn't saying everything's okay. What he was saying is, you're lost. But the eternal state of your soul is not to be lost, it's to be found. And I'm here to find you if you want to be found. I am sweeping the house. I'm sweeping the inside of the house. I'm going through every nook and cranny. Anything that the enemy has done that has pulled value from your life, that has made you feel less valuable, I am here to restore all that was lost to your life. Final story today is we were in Israel and we we're going again, or uh, we're taking a tour again in uh, October. Uh, my parents are going, taking a tour. And if you've not gone to Israel, you need to go to Israel. At some point in your life, the scriptures will just come alive in a fresh new way. And so if you can, go. But we are at a site, an archaeological site called Magdala. They believe it was the home of Mary Magdalene. And we were taking a tour. And a woman by the name of Jennifer, who was a consecrated woman, told us the story of a lost woman. A woman who was in the house but had lost something. You might know her as the woman with the issue of blood. She had a female issue in her life that was rendering her under Levitical law unclean. And she had been walking around those walls for 12 years and nothing had changed. And one day she heard that Jesus was passing through. And she has been ostracized. She has been devalued. She's lived in isolation from outside of maybe just her immediate family. Because under Levitical law, in this time and season, for a woman who was unclean, having what she was having, to touch a rabbi would render him unclean, and in that space, she was to be stoned. And so Jennifer, this consecrated woman, is telling us the story, and I know the story, and I'm listening, and she gets to one pivotal point. So if you know the story, you know what's going to happen. If you don't, let me fill you in. She crawls and gets as low as she can, and she reaches and she touches the hem of his garment, which is a whole other sermon in and of itself. But she touches the hem of his garment, and when she does, Jesus says, who touched me? And his disciples think he's crazy because everyone's touching him. Everyone's pressing in against him. Everyone wants a piece of him for different reasons. But he says, who touched me? Because there's a different touching of Jesus in desperation than there is, and he knows it. And Jesus, so she finally rises up in this moment because she realizes something's happened that for 12 years she's been praying and believing and praying and believing and she's done everything. She's gone to see every single doctor. She's done everything she can in the natural to get rid of her lostness, to get rid of her problem. But she can't. She's been walking around these walls for a long time and nothing's changing. And then in one moment something happens and she stands up and she's kind of like, e me, I did. And in that very moment, what does Jesus say to her? What is the first word that he says to her? When Jennifer said this, tears broke forth from my eyes, and I've never been again, never forgot it. He said to her, daughter, 
Your faith has made you well. I've always jumped right over that into your faith has made you well and looked at the miracle. But here's what I want you to know is Jesus is not a half restoring God. What is the very first thing that he says to her? The very first thing he says, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He is fully standing there in the flesh and he says to her, you are my family. What does that say to everybody else listening? Back off. No stoning today. Put your rocks down. She's my daughter. See, Jesus didn't just heal her physically. Jesus' heart was to heal her in every single way. Before he touched her physical body, he speaks to her identity. Because I'm not sure if you've ever lost something in your life, but if you lose something in your life, sometimes it can feel as though you lose a piece of yourself. And I want you to know that Jesus isn't just good, he's amazing. That he's not just interested in healing your physical condition, he's interested in touching your identity. He is speaking to societal wrongs and trying to see those things be restored. You may have lost a title, I'm here to tell you today that you've not lost one ounce of your value to Jesus. You may have lost something in your sexuality or your innocence, and I'm here to tell you today that you have not lost one ounce of your value to Jesus. You may have gone through a divorce where someone threw you away, I'm here to tell you today that you have not lost one ounce of your value value to Jesus. You have been hurt in the church, and I'm here to tell you today that you have not lost one ounce of your value to Jesus. Why? Because though you may be lost, your value hasn't been to your heavenly Father.